Um, so our, my subject is a huge one, and it's sort of excessively bold and grandiose. And on the other hand, if, if it's 72, you can't be excessively bold and grandiose. When do you get to be? So it's the reenchantment of humanity. The truth of the matter is, I think we're disenchanted and don't know that we're disenchanted. And I think we need to do something about it. And that's what this talk is, I hope, a step uh, uh, towards. So Gordon Brown, when he was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, publicly said, we're reduced to price tags. That's an amazing thing for a Prime Minister of the UK to say. Um, and I think, I think the shot was heard around the world. A and it's an expression of um, our post-enlightenment, late capitalist society. Um, and the question is, is whether our current civilization, the one we're living in right now, us, we, best serves our deep humanity. Well, first of all, I don't think we know what our deep humanity is. But my own gut feeling is the answer is no. In any case, I think we should think about it. And as a guy who gets to come here three years in a row in the fall term, I'm, I'm in love with the University of Vermont. And I think that this is a place where the conversation could or can happen. And I hope it does. Um, there's something even bigger. Uh, in the lifetime of many of you in this room, some form of global civilization is going to emerge. We might all wind up speaking English and eating hamburgers or Chinese and eating chow mein. Um, my own hope is that 30 civilizations weave together, touch one another sufficiently gently to preserve their roots, and sprout new cultural forms uh, to enhance the diversity of ways we can be human. I'll come back to that. But in any case, we have to begin to think about what do we want a, a global civilization or civilizations to be? What can we do about shaping it? And we can only do some things about shaping it. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about Newton. Everybody's familiar with Newton. I can't look at you and not think about about, 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 you have to tell your own story. It's too, it's too sweet. <laughs> uh, we're all familiar with Newton and his three laws of motion and celestial mechanics. I'm going to get back to that and talk about it in considerable detail. Well, in some detail. But it matters intensely to us. And the reason that it matters intensely, Newton, Newton, stunning Newton, it matters intensely to us because he invented celestial mechanics. He taught us how to think as scientists. And early sociologist Max Weber said, with Newton, we became disenchanted and entered modernity. It's a stunning sentence. Furthermore, Weber was right. We did. We got Newton. Then we got the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, then, which was down with the clerics and up with science for the ever-betterment of man. Then we got the Industrial Revolution, and we got our Constitution, and uh, we got increased wealth. And we, are, we, 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 we know the best and the worst of the Enlightenment. We're living it now. We, we don't have to find out more about it. We've been doing it for a couple hundred years. So we became disenchanted. Well, let's start with the hypothesis that some time ago we were enchanted. My ear is the wrong shape. It's not that the little wire thing is the wrong shape. It's, it's my ear. I have to work on it. Um, so let's start with Genesis. I, I, I don't believe in a supernatural God, but that's irrelevant to what I want to say. We all live in the Abrahamic tradition. And in the Old Testament, we all know Genesis. And God creates all of creation, the birds of the, of the, of the air, the animals on the land, the fish of the sea. After splitting day from night and heaven from earth and ocean from land and so on. 
And then he thinks it's a good idea to create Adam, and Eve is a little bit of an afterthought. And he puts Adam in dominion over all of creation. Think about that. Adam is, humanity is, in dominion over all of creation. Creation is humanity's to use. Watch this echo down the ensuing millennia to today. It is our Western heritage. It was fine in the early Bronze Age. The question is, is it fine now? I think not. Um, but there's two other points. Well, one other point I want to make. Um, there's no entailing laws about God's creating everything. God just sort of, as in the wonderful play, um, Green Pastures, if you've never seen it, you should see it. God rears back and passes miracles. And then there's wonderful moments, and he says, the trouble with passing miracles, you pass one, you've got to rear back and pass another. It's an absolutely sweet play. Um, well, the early Greek philosopher Heraclitus, before Socrates, so he's one of the pre-Socratics, said something very similar. He said, the world bubbles forth. I think it's an exquisite phrase. It's an exquisite image. Um, for Heraclitus, there's no entailing either. There's the world just bubbling forth. Where I'm going to get to, now that I've gotten this far, is to tell you the following. For physics, I believe that there are entailing laws. For the evolution of the biosphere, the economy, and human life, the burden of what I'm going to be saying with my coworker, Giuseppe Longo, uh, at the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, is there is no entailing law for the becoming evolution of the biosphere. Um, so before Newton, uh, again, we were enchanted. Let's take the 16th century. Um, so there were the black and the white magi, the magicians. Kepler was the last of the white magicians. But the black magi thought, well, if we have some occult knowledge and special words, we can use that occult knowledge to stand nature on her head and rest our due, a warped version of God's promise to Adam. But it's the same thing. It's the same heritage. And it's magic. Then comes Newton, and we know Newton. Three laws of motion, a universal law of gravitation. He invented the differential and the integral calculus. And he taught us how to think. And here's how you think. You have a billiard ball, a set of billiard balls on the table, and you say, Isaac, now what? And he says, don't be stupid. I told you what. Um, measure the initial conditions of the billiard balls, namely p position and momenta of all the balls and the sizes of the balls. Measure the boundary conditions of the table. So you have the initial conditions and the boundary conditions. Write down my equations in differential equation form. And then use this thing that I did about integration. Integrate the equations, and you will obtain the trajectories of the balls for the entire future of the universe. Now, what's integration? It's deduction. Deduction is entailment. So it fits Aristotle's model of scientific explanation. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is a mortal. That scientific explanation is deduction. Furthermore, what, what, what in addition Newton did is he took Aristotle's four causes and picked out one efficient cause and mathematized it. Integration is efficient cause. OK? So. We have entailment. And there's another thing to be said about this. Um, in the Newtonian uh, mathematization of all of this, in the Newtonian mechanical universe, we live in a causal nexus, a web of cause and effect. That's what we think reality is. 
And furthermore, in some deep sense, we think that's all reality is. And that's our world, that's an awful lot of our worldview. Now, it's terribly important that in physics, Newton's framework remains the framework of physics today. So let's take Einstein and general relativity, or Schrodinger and quantum mechanics. It's the same framework. You have laws of motion, you have initial conditions and boundary conditions, you write down ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations, you integrate them to get, by deduction, the entailed trajectory. For Einstein, it's his world lines in general relativity. For Schrodinger, it's the trajectory of a probability distribution. But it's the same conceptual framework. So everything is entailed. And if you listen to Steven Weinberg in Dreams of a Final Theory, there is the reductionist dream that down there, there is a theory to be written on Weinberg's t-shirt okay, um, and known only to Weinberg. Okay? That entails everything that happens in the universe. Everything. Everything is entailed. That's the dream of physics for centuries since Newton. Um, my, my friend Marcelo Glazer at Dartmouth, with whom I co-blog, has made an interesting analogy between the belief in a monotheistic God who makes everything happen and a single law that entails everything that happens. It's an interesting analogy, and Marcelo might be right. The heritage may be the same heritage. I'm going to say it's wrong. It's fine for physics, but it's not fine for everything that happens. Um, so, um, again, let me tell you about Giuseppe Longo. Uh, he's a, a senior Italian-French mathematician at the Ecole Polytechnique, which is sort of the MIT of Paris. And he and I ha have been working together now for half a year. Um, and. We've published some things about which I'm talking uh, now. We published a post entitled The End of a Physics Worldview, Heraclitus and the Watershed of Life. I love the title. I didn't make it up. The editors at NPR made it up. But I'll steal it. <laughs> uh, and I actually gave a talk on it at MIT August 19th, I mean October 19th. There's a video of it. This film from this talk and that film, which is an hour long, will be put online so you guys can get to it if you want to. Um, and we're working on the serious paper. Let me begin now with Darwin. Suppose you said to Darwin, uh, or I said to Darwin, uh, Mr. Darwin, what's the function of my heart? Well, he'd look at me and he'd say, pump, pump blood. I can't do Darwin's accent but he'd say pump blood. But I'm a doctor, and, and I'd say, but Mr. Darwin, um, my heart makes heart sounds, and I happen to know that it jiggles water in my pericardial sac. Why aren't those the functions of my heart? And Darwin would say, look, Kaufman, you have a heart because your ancestors had hearts, and it was selectively advantageous for them to pump blood, and that's why you have a heart. So he'd give a selective account. I want you to notice a first thing about this. Darwin's use of the function of the heart picks out a subset of the causal consequences of the heart. Pumping blood, not jiggling water in my pericardial sac. This is really going to be impor important in a little bit. Now, in physics, the word function, in this sense, doesn't come up. And I want to turn to where in the world does it become okay to use this word function? And it's actually extraordinarily interesting um, and surprising. And I'm going to tell it to you this way. Do you all know what a protein is? It's a linear string of 20 kinds of amino acids, it's like 20 beads on a string, and then they fold up and do neat things like catalyze reactions. A typical protein in you is about 300 amino acids long. There are 20 kinds of amino acids. How many possible proteins are there, length 200 amino acids? Well, it's 20 times 20 times 20, 200 times, which is 20 to the 200th, 
or 10 to the 260th, which is a big number, even given our death, it's a big number. Okay. Um, now, there are 10 to the 80th particles in the known universe. The shortest time scale in the universe is the Planck time scale of 10 to the minus 43rd seconds. If all 10 to the 80th particles, ignoring space-like separation, were doing nothing but making proteins length 200 on the Planck time scale, it would take 10 raised to the 39th power times the history of the universe to make all those proteins once. And this means something physical. It means that at levels above atoms, the universe is on a unique trajectory in making proteins and in making complex things like hearts. The universe is grotesquely, to say it as the physicists do, non-ergodic, non-repeating. New laws may emerge because of that. And it's going to be fundamental for what I want to say. Because the next thing I have to introduce is the idea of a Kantian whole, named, of course, after Kant, who said, an organized being then has the property that the whole exists for and by means of the parts, and the parts for and by means of the whole. Without going into a bunch of examples, like collectively autocatalytic peptide sets, which I love and exist, you're a Kantian whole, and your parts sustain your existence, and the existence of the part is sustained by you. The same is true of a, of a bacterium. So a bacterium is a Kantian whole. Now, here's something really intriguing. When Darwin gives the answer that you have a heart in you because it has selective significance, he didn't know it, but he was explaining something more. He was explaining why hearts exist in the universe when most complex things will never exist. I find that pretty striking. Because of the Kantian whole character of the bacterium or you, we can assign the notion of function. The function of a part in you is that which helps sustain you as a Kantian whole, so you get to exist as a complex thing in the universe when most complex things will never exist. So the word function isn't meaningless. It means something physical. I just told you what it is. Now I'm going to come to something that I'm in love with. Darwin had many wonderful ideas, and I'm now going to tell you about something called a Darwinian pre-adaptation. Um, and I'm going to have to speed up. Um, so here's a pre-adaptation. Darwin said that a, a part of an organism of no use in one environment, say jiggling water in my pericardial sac, might be useful in another environment, so be selected. That's a Darwinian pre-adaptation. He doesn't mean foresight. Steve Gould called them exaptations. So I'm going to give you just one example. I'm taking too long, so I have to talk faster. Um, some fish have a swim bladder. It's a sac partially filled with air, partially filled with water, the ratio of which tunes neutral buoyancy in the water column. Paleontologists believe that the swim bladder evolved from the lungs of lungfish. Water got into some lung, and it was poised to become a swim bladder. Let's say the paleontologists are right. OK, so now you know what a pre-adaptation is. I'm only going to give one example. I got three questions. Did a new function arise in the biosphere? Yeah, neutral buoyancy in the water column. Two, did it change the evolution of the biosphere? Sure did. New species of fish with swim bladders. And another point that dawned on me a couple months ago is the following. Once the swim bladder exists, it's a new, what I will call, adjacent possible empty niche because a worm or a bacterium could come to live and evolve to live in the swim bladder, right? So the swim bladder, once it exists, changes the possible directions of evolution of the biosphere. We all agree? Now I want to hit you with the question that I adore hitting us all with. And I know what you're going to say, because I've asked 10,000 people. Now that you know what a Darwinian pre-adaptation is, just for human beings, does anybody in the room think that you could name all possible Darwinian pre-adaptations for human beings in the next 3 million years? Anybody think so? 
Of course you don't think so. I want you to have an important emotional experience. Imagine trying to do this. Can you feel your mind going blank? I mean, d does your mind go blank? I mean, mine, mine goes blank. You want me to do what? Why can't we? Well, in the paper with Giuseppe and in the talk at MIT, I give much more detailed answers, but let me give a starting answer to you right now. How would we name all selective conditions? How would we know we named them all? How would we name ahead of time the one or many features of one or many organisms that might turn out to be pre-adaptations? We can't. And I can go into this in more detail, but haven't time. So we can't do it. Well, this means a bunch of stuff. Um, oh, let me point out an obvious thing. The swim bladder, it's a part of the fish, which is a Kantian whole. So the, the adaptation occurs in a part of the organism and changes its function, but it's selected at the level of the Kantian whole, the fish. Okay? This means something that matters. The same thing's going to be true in the economy. We'll see in a moment. This means something that matters in our life. Not only do we not know what will happen, and I want to drive this home, we don't even know what can happen. We don't know what can happen. So let me take a, a, a case that's a little different. Let me take a coin and flip it 10,000 times. It's a fair coin. And I want to calculate the probability that it'll come up heads 5,423 times. Can I do that? Sure, I just bring up the binomial theorem and I calculate it. But notice that I knew it. So in this case, I don't know what will happen, right? I don't know if it'll come up bad, but I can calculate the probability. But notice that I knew ahead of time all possible outcomes of flipping the coin 10,000 times. All heads, all tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, right? I knew the sample space of the process so I could construct a probability measure. But we just said we don't know the possible evolution of the biosphere by Darwinian pre-adaptations, yes? Then can we construct a probability measure? No, we can't. We do not know the sample space. So not only do we not know what can happen, we can't even make an informed probability statement about it. We just don't know. The same thing is true in the economy. And I, let me just take you through something that we've lived through various parts of depending upon our age. The Turing machine gives rise to the mainframe computer, whose widespread sale enables the invention by Steve Jobs of the personal computer, whose widespread sale enables the invention of word processing, whose widespread uh, distribution and sales means lots of sharing of files, which enables the invention of the World Wide Web, which enables selling things on the web, which places content on the web, which enables Google to make a fortune and led to Facebook and the Arabic Spring. Do you think anybody knew? Of course we didn't know. Okay? Now, pause there, because I want to go back to something that blew my mind. We agreed that when the swim bladder came into existence, it, it changed the possible evolution of the biosphere, right? Okay. We're not all biologists, but pretend you are. Do we think selection had something to do in an evolving population of fish with making a working swim bladder? Sure, probably, okay? Did selection have anything whatsoever to do with making the swim bladder as a new adjacent possible empty niche? No, it did not. Selection did not struggle to make a new niche right? This means something truly that blows my mind. It means that without any selection at all, the biosphere is building its own future directions of becoming. The biosphere is building its own ways of becoming, and so is the economy in the example that I just gave you. That We're so far from Newton, it's unbelievable. The biosphere is building its own future possibilities. 
with no selection. Here is what I want to call radical emergence, the bacterium coming to evolve in the swim bladder. It's not the emergence we normally talk about in complexity theory. It's a radical emergence. And I find it enchanting. I find it a kind of, if you forgive me, well, I mean it. It's a kind of natural magic. William Gaddis in the recollections, recognition, sorry, um, said there's no truth beyond magic. How much magic do you need? Because this is happening all the time in the biosphere. It's happening all the time in the evolution of the econosphere. It's happening all the time in human culture. How much magic do we need for re-enchantment? It's not the Newtonian world at all. The next thing to notice is the following. The swim bladder does not cause the bacterium to evolve to live in the swim bladder. Because what happens in the bacterium, or the worm, is a quantum, often, a quantum, a-causal, random, indeterminate mutation. It's a-causal. Quantum mechanics is a-causal on all interpretations of quantum mechanics. So the swim bladder doesn't cause the evolution of the worm that comes to live in the swim bladder. I'm going to use a really important new word that you know. It enables it. I've already used it. It doesn't cause it. It enables it. And it's happening all the time. It's happening in the story that I told you from the computer to, to the Arab Spring. And that means that not only do we live in a causal network, we live in a network of enablement and opportunity that we don't even recognize. I find that enchanting, too. Now, that does not mean that enablement is always good. To give my saddest example, we have our Constitution, and the Supreme Court came up with this utterly stupid decision in Citizens United which is enabling corporations to overwhelm our voting rights as individuals. I think that's evil enablement. Enablement doesn't mean it's going to be good or bad. Good or bad can happen. Um, that doesn't mean it's not magic. It's up to us to try to make things work well. But we live as Gordon Kaufman, my colleague but not my relative, a theologian at Harvard said, we live in face of mystery. Okay, so I'm moving along pretty fast. I'm going to finish in really fast. I'm going to skip stuff. So now I just want to show you um, rapidly that we can't have any laws, and then I'll cut things short. Um, When the Darwinian pre-adaptation happens with the swim bladder, we cannot pre-state, you all agreed, we cannot pre-state that the swim bladder would emerge. Now, the swim bladder is part of the organism, and it's selected at the level of the organism, right? That means that we cannot pre-state what becomes the relevant variable or variables in the evolution of the biosphere. We don't know ahead of time what those variables are going to be. This means something absolutely fundamental that distinguishes biology from physics. In physics, you can pre-state the phase space. Giuseppe Longo insists on this and is better at it than I. In biology, we face something entirely new. The phase space itself is changing all the time, and it's changing in ways that we can't say. So also in getting from the computer to Arabic spring. The relevant variables are changing all the time. The phase space is changing. Now, that means something stunning. In order to write down mathematical laws of motion, you need concepts with settled meanings. The law of the pendulum depends on the notion of mass and length, which we know. But beforehand, we don't know the concepts about the swim bladder and neutral buoyancy in the water column, right? That means we cannot write down equations of motion for the becoming of the biosphere. 
We can't write down equations of motion, nor can we for the economy, nor for culture. We can't write down the equations of motion. But there's another part. The swim bladder, which we could not pre-state, is the boundary condition in which evolution of the worm takes place, right? But we can't pre-state the boundary condition. If we can't pre-state the boundary condition, we can't do what Newton told us. He said, have the laws of motion, write them down in differential equation form, measure the initial conditions, put in the boundary conditions like the shape of the billiard table, and integrate. But if we don't know the boundary conditions, we can't integrate. It would be like trying to integrate the billiard balls on the table when we don't know the shape of the table that's changing all the time in ways that we don't know. What does this mean? It means we don't have laws of motion, we can't integrate, but integration is deduction, and deduction is entailment. Therefore, there is no law that entails the becoming of the biosphere. There is no law that entails the evolution of the economy. It's a separate question whether or not I can take Chuck's heart. Th that's Chuck. He has one, too. Okay? Most of us do. If you don't, please leave. Okay? Um, do I think that a, a good physicist has a reasonable chance of understanding Chuck's heart now that he's got one? Sure. So let's distinguish between diachronic, across time, evolution, and synchronic now. I think that reductionism probably more or less works with all the usual caveats about emergence in the, sen in the normal senses, um, synchronically. Diachronically, there's no law. That means something huge that bears on re-enchantment. You see, it means that we're beyond the framework of Newton and Einstein and Schrodinger, who said, write down the laws, the initial and boundary conditions, write the laws in differential form, ODEs, or ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations. Now please integrate, which is deduction, which is entailment. We can't do it for the biosphere. That means we're beyond the hegemony of Newton, who has dominated our thinking for 350 years. We really are. We're even beyond Darwin, because brilliant as Darwin was, he didn't see the radical emergence of the fact that the biosphere is building the possibilities of uh, its evolution with no selection. It's building its own possibilities for becoming. Darwin didn't think of that. I did. <laughs> Having tea with my wife in Santa Fe. And I'm, I said, my God! <laughs> so I, I claim credit for that one, okay? So radical emergence is ours. The world is different than we thought. I think this is the beginning of being possibly re-enchanted. Um, and I'm going to end with the following things. What does it mean for our lives? And I think, I think that Chris is going to partially talk about this. I'm turning to the pragmatists and trying to learn about them. You see, if it's the Newtonian worldview, you don't have to be a pragmatist. You just look at the equations and calculate the results. That is to say there's a sharp distinction between knowing, being, and doing. If you're a physicist calculating the motion of the rocket, you know. And somebody's got to be an engineer and build one, and that's why Dom's here. Um, but you know. If we are in the biosphere becoming, we are embodied in life making our way, not knowing what's going to happen not knowing what can happen. That's the cornerstone of, of pragmatism, but it's more than the cornerstone of pragmatism. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second. So I've been reading Emerson and Thoreau and C.S. Peirce, three 18th century American figures. Emerson held a beautiful view. It was the notion of um, perfectionism. And what he said was, we should live our lives perfecting our virtues. He meant by virtues, our strengths. I love it, but here's what's inadequate about it. It's as if your virtues are laid out in full sight for you, and you just look at them like, you know, 
you've all been to Europe and you've been to breakfast and everything's laid out on the tables and you pick up what you want and everything's in plain sight. I don't think it's like that. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Peirce added to the idea of science from deduction and induction, which we all know, the notion of abduction, which is the inventive search for a hypothesis. We all go through it all the time in life. But now we face the problem of abduction in getting on with our lives when we do not know all the time even what can happen. That's our real life. I'm falling in love with a different phrase. It's living the well-discovered life. Not the well-considered life, the well-discovered life. Where what you discover in your life, and we live it, you discover new pathways that open before you, just like getting from the Turing machine to the Arabic Spring. New pathways, new possibilities open before us all the time. That is what our life is. I think this is the beginning of a new vision of who we are and how we are to be put together with an understanding of our evolved social primate humanity. I want to end with an image of a global civilization. As I said, should we all speak English and eat hamburger or oatmeal? I hope not or Chinese and eat Jamein. I hope not. I love them all. My own hope is something like the following. When our civilizations touch one another, they tend to ruin one another. Look what we did to the Inuits, even with good intention. We, we brought them the snowmobile and blew apart their civilization. If we can learn to take our 30 global civilizations, touch one another gently enough to protect the roots, but firmly enough to engender new cultural forms like Chinese Cuban cuisine in New York, we will engender a vast creativity of new forms of being human, new virtues to explore and become. And so I want to leave you with that. I find it enchanting. Meanwhile, we kill one another. We have a shadow side. And there is no easy solution for that. Thank you.